The following is excerpted from Kill Switch, book one of the Life Force series by Joss Conlon, read by the author. Chapter 2. Pervasive Sadness Sorting through and cleaning up your misaligned values will begin to propel you toward the greatness that your life could be. This, in turn, will foster a sense of motivation, and motivation begets locomotion. Movement is paramount in maintaining both health and happiness. There is no cure for any mental malaise that is as powerful as the simple act of moving forward. This momentum, however, is not always easy to maintain. To make matters worse, once you've stopped moving forward or begun moving backward, it is often terribly difficult to get started again in the right direction. Most people call this situation depression. It's a pervasive sense of sadness or boredom, a continual dissatisfaction. Left to fester, this dis-ease becomes a disease. It has to be stopped in its tracks, literally. The good news is that it's remarkably simple to defeat. So simple, in fact, that it could cost the drug companies billions. If I could just get this chapter into the hands of everyone and convince them to consistently and habitually practice this simple technique, depression would be a thing of the past. Before we begin, though, I'm legally obligated to tell you some things, and these are important considerations, so pay attention. First, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychiatrist. I have no letters beside my name. I can't prescribe medication. Hell, I can't even spell some of the medications they're pimping, uh, pumping out these days. I didn't go to college. I spent time in the loony bin as a patient, not a practitioner. So in short, medically speaking, I have no freaking idea what I'm talking about. Second, and because of everything I've just said, it's important that you hear my standard disclaimer. It appears in really tiny type on the copyright page of my book, but here it is again in slightly more obnoxious tones, so you can't say you didn't hear it. None of the information contained within this book shall be considered a substitute for consultation with a licensed physician, psychologist, or other qualified professional practitioner, nor for any therapies, medications, or other activities they prescribe. The suggestions found in this book are expressly the opinion of the author, and following these suggestions is at the sole discretion and risk of the reader who assumes full responsibility for his or her actions in relation to the information contained herein. In plain language, what all of this means is that, legally speaking, I'm not responsible if you actually take my advice. The society that exists around me says that I'm legally permitted to share my opinion with you, but I'm completely unqualified, and so you shouldn't listen to a word I say. You should continue doing what the educated, licensed, obviously far wiser than me, and justifiably more well-paid professionals tell you to do. To that, I'll only add one thing. How's that working for you? Look, all joking aside, depression is a serious business. No, I mean that. It's a serious business. According to an article from the New York Times, the United States government alone spends about $150 billion annually on direct medical costs. That's not counting private, personal, out-of-pocket expenses borne by those not enrolled in government programs. Now, that's part of an overall half-trillion-dollar mental health epidemic. That loose change is being deposited under somebody's couch cushions. Is it any wonder guys like me aren't supposed to talk about simple, effective, drug-free fixes? Now, I have no problem with drugs that are proven effective and medically necessary. Drugs today are just a much more advanced version of the products dispensed by the village medicine man throughout history. I chew on a stick and find that my back doesn't hurt anymore. I tell the shaman... He's the one with the bone through his nose. He goes out and realizes through trial and error that if he peels the bark of the stick, dries it out, grinds it up, and soaks it in the urine of a boar, it works twice as well using half as much. I'm okay with that. I get it. What bothers me is that in my unqualified opinion, most drugs today simply aren't medically necessary. Moreover, I believe that they're overprescribed because they're acceptable quick fixes that require little more effort than scrawling out a script. And the aforementioned scrawling pays really well. In fact, only the drug manufacturers make more scratch on this transaction, which is the other reason drugs are overprescribed. Mula with a capital Mu. So I ask again, how's this working for you? Well, according to another study, there was a 74% increase in the number of U.S. adults receiving treatment for depression over a 10-year period from 1999 to 2009. Drug expenditures increased by about one-third, and ambulatory expenses for the treatment of depression more than doubled during the same period of time. Sounds like the answer to my question is not so well. 
What about therapy? Well, I suppose if you don't mind paying $100 per hour so a clinician can listen to your problems and conclude each session with, same time next week, well then, therapy is fine. Hey, they know what they're doing, right? I'm just a nut job with a typewriter. Let me lay out two things, though. First, a lot of the accepted therapies practiced today involve sending you back into your memory to relive painful or otherwise destructive periods from your past. To me, this is akin to you walking barefoot through a room full of glass. At the other end, your therapist says, Okay, now walk back through the room and tell me how it feels. My idea, as insane as it sounds, is for you to say, I walked through frickin' glass, and I'm not doing that ever again. Then I, as an unqualified know-nothing, would bandage your feet and say, You're really an idiot if you walk across that glass again. I'd pat you on the butt and send you on your merry way, yelling behind you, If you see glass in front of you, go a different way. Crazy, I know. Obviously, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Here's the second and most important thing. With the most stubborn of mental issues, the ones that don't respond to other proven treatments, the licensed professionals use something called cognitive behavioral therapy to, get this, teach patients to help themselves. What a novel concept. So let's break that down a bit. Cognitive means you're aware of something. You watch out for it. Behavioral means you act. You do something. Therapy, in this case, means you do something different from what you were doing before. In other words, you learn to see something coming, and when you spot it on the mental horizon, you change what you do in reaction to it. That's cognitive behavioral therapy in a nutshell. They get $100 an hour for this, folks. I'm charging you just a couple of bucks with a money-back guarantee. Now, the process I'm about to outline uses the same principle. It's a mental exercise that uses visualization to change the way you think throughout your day. It's simple, discreet, and effective. Remember, CBT is used when nothing else works. If this works when other things don't, why don't they just do this in the first place? Off the top of my head, I can think of a half trillion reasons. But what do I know? I'm just a nut job with a typewriter.